Good morning, everyone. My name is Beatrice Namia Kliantaya. I work for NRT. NRT stands for Northern Rangelands Trust. And um, I think I'm new here, so I need to give you a background of what NRT does and what is NRT trading before I tell you what, uh, what I was to discuss today. Um, NRT trade, NRT. NRT, which is the Northern Greenlands Trust, is basically um, an organization that works with community conservancies in Northern Kenya. And the role of NRT is basically to work with community conservancies and government issues, peace security, uh, wildlife management, and uh, monitoring. Uh, we also have a livelihood um, goal, and that is on the livelihood goal that NRT trading comes up. And the role of NRT trading is basically to work with the communities and finding out what are the uh, economic opportunities that we can engage in in this um, northern landscape. And um, most of our community conservancies are in the northern part of Kenya. And um, NRT trading works with uh, different things. One is the beadworks program, which I'm in charge of. Uh, we also have the livestock to market. We have uh, Moran program, which we call the savings and credit. We also have different other things. But, um, <laughs> so, maybe you can continue and yeah. ask. Is computers? I'll try and work on the computer time. So, what I'm planning to talk about is the role of women natural resource management within the community conservancy structure. At the moment, I'm in charge of production, which is the business side of it. But I've always been very passionate about women, and uh, that came up because before I joined NRT Trading, I was working as a conservancy manager in one of the community conservancies. Um, for those who know Kenya, it's in Laikipia. Uh, the Nelbunga Community Conservancy, which is basically bringing together nine community conservancies, group branches to form a conservancy. And I was really curious. So I've been a conservancy manager for uh, some years, and all the board members were men, and uh, I don't see women participating. Yet when you're in this community, we have men, women, children, and everyone else. So, while well, I was working as a conservancy manager, uh, we had different things happening in the Kipen. That is where the conservancy is. Uh, one, of the problems, yeah, one of the problems was um, our communities will move into the private land. We, we have private land, communities, and government land. So we had um, our con community conservancy members going to private land to grace legally. And uh, we were doing some um, rentlands issues and all that. And then while I was doing all that, I thought of where are the women in this? How would I use um, the influence they have on everyone to make sure that um, I manage the grazing problems that I had? So while doing that, uh, an opportunity came up with Conservation International where I was able to go through the interviews and got a fellowship to do some work with them. So that is how the issues about women involvement in uh, conservancy developed for me. And then when an opportunity came up in NRT trading to run the Bidworks program, I took it up because it gave me a bigger uh, platform to amplify the voice of women in the whole of community conservancy. Uh, just a background information of where we are based. We are based in the northern part of Kenya. This basically um, built up to what Kaunga, Moiko, and Professor say. That uh, we in the uh, northern part of Kenya, it is more arid. Um, we have constant droughts in the northern side, conflicts between the tribes, and um, more of livestock economy. That's all we do there, mainly. Um, our communities are also pastoralist and very patriarchal because they are mainly of Maasai, Samburu, Tukana tribes. And the land ownership is communal, which can either be group ranches or the former trust land. So that is the concept. 
Um, within the northern side, we have Valnet. So, just to give you an, a, just a quick overview of the north. So, that's where we are, where you see the pale, um, these colors, that's where the communities are that I work with at the moment. Uh, just pictures of the landscape, uh, the kind of livestock that people keep. We have camels, goats, sheep, and everything else. And then came the community conservancy. When I talk of a community conservancy, I think of a land use plan. Um, one, because when I say Naibunga Conservancy, Naibunga Conservancy, Community Conservancy, is the whole landscape. It's the livestock, it's the people, it's the grazing space, it's the core areas, it's the lodge facility. So everything all together. And uh, within the Community Conservancy, we have leadership uh, who are identified and selected by the communities from different villages. And so we have a board that usually represents the community conservancy. Um, and these are the team that sit up and agree. We are doing grazing on this side. We are like doing core areas for lodges and all that in this particular area. Um, this is also the same board that now engages with investors or development uh, agents in that particular area. Uh, they also participate in all the grazing issues, meet be movement or settlements and all that. And all the world like that is within that space. So, <coughs> if you look at, um, for those who work with pastoral communities, what is the probability that a woman will be selected to be part of the board? Very minimal. And um, that being the case, they are the majority in that community. And um, whatever decision the leadership takes up ultimately affects what happens at household levels. So that has always been um, my interest and in trying to find a way of um, engaging and working with the communities. So while working with the women, I formed different forums. First, at the, when I was a conservancy manager and now as I work with NRT trading on the beatworks. So I have forums where we discuss different things, like how much um, knowledge the women have about what can happen in a conservancy, in terms of grazing, in terms of uh, um, knowledge and all that. If you look at the livestock management at the conservancy or community level, most of it is actually being taken care of by the women, because kids, most of the kids at home, I mean in school, so all the labor, the grazing, sometimes it's all done by the women. If you look at utilization of resources within the, the community conservancies, the majority of people participating in the actual utilization is the women. They'll go for water, pasture, uh, natural resources, like grass and all the construction things that they use in the village. So they, they are really like neat. Um, if you look at the whole, set up of a community, if the women take charge of how stable that conservancy or community is. Um, in terms of conflict resolution or even conflict happening, they actually influence. Within the pastoral communities, women influence what happens in the landscape through music. They do songs and if they praise the morans, those guys will cause problems in that conservancy or in the neighboring areas. So looking at all these things, uh, women might not be so <coughs> in control of conservancy, but they really have a lot of influence on what happens in terms of management and utilization of all the natural resources within that landscape. So when I have and discuss this with them, there are several things that are happening in the landscape. We have very severe droughts and women face the burden of everything, from the household, the children, and everything else. There's a lot of conflict in the north, always constant fighting between the tribes uh, over natural resources, 
And I think the people who are affected most are the women. I spend like almost every, every day of my life with them because at the moment I work with about 1,300. So every day there's this voice that comes up. When there's a fight between the Tukana and Samburu, you, you feel their pressure. Um, most of our people also rely on the livestock and uh, they, they also have the burden of providing for their families. The literacy, illiteracy levels is very high. Most of them are not going to school, like for more um, poor land uses. If the, the team that is in charge of planning for land does not do their work well, they face all these issues. So there, there are lots of challenges, as you can read, that um, the women go through, but the voice is not as loud as we really want it to be at the conservancy level. So what do we really want as women and uh, people working in the pastoral communities and being a pastoralist myself, their voice is they want to be part of this. They want to be included in the decision making processes. But again, they need to be empowered because we might not be to have them sitting in the raising committees in the boards, but how influential, how um, are they strong enough to talk about issues? So there's the whole issues of empowerment that still needs to be done for them to fully participate effectively in terms of utilization of natural resources within the community services. So some of the things that we are currently doing, um, I have networks within the different community conservancies. Um, we, we also like, I believe that if you want to empower women, please do it through economics empower them economically because you can't tell me about a conservancy if my children are hungry. So I, I feel like um, to be able to talk about other things, let's empower them economically. So we, we utilize our traditional skills to do things and participate in the national or international markets in terms of big ones. And we are able to export beads and do things that the market wants for Australian zoos and conservation organizations across the world. We also have credit and saving groups where we encourage women to think about the future, have something that you're ready if something comes up, you know, a negative situation happens. Uh, we also lobby to have them uh, included in all conservancy events, all the capacity uh, building trainings and exposure that all these women need to know. They need to know their space, their influence, and what abilities they have to be able to influence what, um, and what happens in their landscape. So thank you very much. Questions for Beatrice? Michael? Thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, the, the issue of uh, the, the the position of women within pastoral society. Those are very difficult conversation to have. Um, there's this paradox. On the one hand, women are extremely powerful. On the other hand, pastoral communities are patriarchal yeah. and women are marginalized. Yeah. It's a paradox which, as an outsider, I often find very difficult to, you know, to reconcile. Uh, you, you talk about economic empowerment. The nature of economic empowerment that I see in pastoral areas is often the same, beads, so on. And, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, this is good for livelihood, but is this economic empowerment? So I'm, I'm, I, I just wanted to find out from the work that you do, mm -hmm. is there, is this scale, is there scalability in terms of where this, where this goes? Because, you know, Beads and corridory and so on. That has been done from time immemorial. We try. I mean, every time we talk about development in pastoral areas, talk about the parent women, that's what we're talking about. And the conversation still continues. Women are marginalized. Although if you if you if you go a little deeper, women are extremely powerful. It's, it's quite confusing. Um thank you, Mike. Um one thing is that finding a balance between culture and you know like giving everybody an equal opportunity is complex in itself but again if you look at the whole landscape for it to have a concrete 
um, like even for a decision to be really effective, if you are to do something in a conservancy, if you don't involve the women in that space, things might not just actually happen. So it's finding that balance, you know, like having a way of dealing with issues while still respecting the cultural uh, norms and issues and, and of that community. If you are to do an, uh, an issue about the women, you do forums with women and explain things to them. But you cannot like come to one area and impose on the men and all that. Number two, they will not even, because of our culture and how we brought up, will give the men the space. So you have to understand the cultural expectation and how to bring up the women to the level of equal participation in the issues about our conservancy. When it comes to uh, big works and all the things that we've been doing, it's true. Uh, bidding has been happening across the world. I mean, with all the communities that have the skills. But what is different about what I do or what we do is it's more than just bidding. It's more about um, helping the women understand the market. When I participate in international trade fairs and all that, I go down to meet them and explain the network and how business works. They run uh, the production system. So I, I am not fully in charge. I have uh, what we call star bidders who are village entrepreneurs who basically understand when a customer says I want a particular thing at this particular color at this particular time. So the essence is I'm teaching them the skill so that even if there's no bid works, they can they have the, the, the basic skills to run a business, wherever they are. And then we have the issue of, uh, uh, if you look at the, the circles, the savings and credit, it's been all over the rest of Kenya. But for the northern communities, that is something totally new. So these are uh, some of the ideas that we are going beyond big works, or just bidding, to prepare them for the future. Yeah. Um, we had Colin first, and then we had a couple of hands, and then John and Robert, We'll see how you call him on. Yeah, um, the first one you've got. Um, on, on the theme of economic empowerment, you says I know nothing about um, these uh, areas and cultures. So, um, but from what the real privacy of livestock, um, it became clear, very clear in your talk and from, from some others. Um, how does, that's where the real wealth is. Yeah. So how does that work? A family's wealth, a household's wealth is in the cattle. What, what's the relationship between a woman and a man as heads of yeah. these households with regard to that wealth? Uh, for the pastoral communities, um, the goats, the cows, and everything is owned by the man. So as a woman, I don't have authority to sell and return. But I, I take part in managing and all that. Uh, if you look at the whole landscape, the droughts, the, all these things happening in the world, we don't have as much cattle as we used to have. The rainland is degraded. There's so much happening that we can't just be focused on the livestock itself alone. We have to think of other ways to coexist. If uh, you look at the conflict, sometimes you, you had 300 cows and then one tribe came over and took all your cows something like that. So those are the realities happening in the north. So what we are doing at the moment is with the big works and the business skills that we are teaching the women, it prepares them. It's giving them an alternative. When it's so dry, the kids can continue going to school. Uh, when things are good, you have some little money you can save for long-term issues. So that's the situation. Good. Uh, John next, I think, and then Robert. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or Stephen, and then Robert, and then John. Let's um, go. Well, thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, you've spoken, uh, you've described uh, in the section on challenges, land use planning as a challenge to women. Do you want to just explain a little bit about how that is? Um, land use planning is mainly done by the conservancies and all that. And sometimes when you look at uh, the grazing issues, the settlement plans, where can I get water, and all that. 
at the end of the day, if it's not done with consultation with the women, for them to really understand why this has to be, um, why this has to be done in particular ways, it brings issues to them. Sometimes they, they feel like it's not fair, it's not right for them. Uh, I just thank you very much. Uh, yeah. You see, this is a bit of a thing you say. You are laying all the time. <laughs> There's no space where, you know. I just said, the, for instance, the uh, presentation that uh, John gave us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, depth, mm -hmm. uh, historical mm -hmm. Where we are all coming, you know, for instance, what you presented. Uh, we talked about you know they create space or they shrink your space. Uh, Rust for people used to when things are not okay here they will move to Chad, but all that has been shrunk. And then uh, the wealth of our people there was in their cattle yeah. and the, the land, mm -hmm. the but. The political center that has been shown. Yeah. What have they done? They come to you and say, okay, beats, market, and, you know. This is the political center. You see, the larger picture is not that it's the people themselves that are doing this. It's the whole historical process that is squeezing. And that is why this uh, that is, is very good for us to begin to understand that. If, if you don't see the larger picture, you end up even killing, you know, your other groups coming to kill the other ones. No, it's, it's a tribal. No, this whole thing is big. And that's where my young lady, as best people we've gone, you know, do a broad analysis. I was telling uh, young Steve last night. Young <laughs> Don't leave your Messiahness. Be a Messiah. You leave it. An elephant lives with lions and all that, but it is still a lion. It doesn't pretend to be an elephant. You see what I'm saying? I was saying something two weeks ago with your friends in Nairobi. You know, this uh, guy of ours said, No, Africans, that's why we are here. We should go on the moon. Who says well, we need to be on the moon? We need to be in Kibera. <laughs> So please, you know, yeah. A, an example was given, uh, Collins, I'll tell you, professors, we were in a consortium on water, and uh, the, this student of ours was in, uh, in the Netherlands, one of the universities, and they had developed this thing where you can get, a, you know, human waste and put in the field and so on. You know, the PhD, you were on the Skype. And then one of our guys asked the question, as long as Mao Zedong, they were using cattle dam to, for energy in China, they stay and remain here. The new guy comes and using the nuclear energy. That week they were circling the moon. <coughs> so within our space, see how these changes could also be used. Not to just do bits, to take advantage of this for bigger things. Beads is okay. I'm not saying it's not okay. But let's think, you know, <laughs> how are the beads? It's much bigger. It will help humanity. It's not that it's only you. You never know. God works in strange ways. So, manager, think out of the box. <coughs> right, thank you. Uh, of course, I understand the bigger, complex issues that yeah. uh, maybe personally I don't even know where to begin. Like, um, the whole issues of land. <coughs> you know, you cannot restrict a pastoral list to one group runs how many acres of land and all that. There's the whole complexities about um, politics and all these other issues. So, of course, I understand there are bigger, bigger problems that needs to be addressed. And um, I believe in do your little, you do your little, and we all do a bigger goal and achieve something big. Thank you. Let's hold the applause. We have just a couple more. There have to be a bit of questions. Okay. Yeah, John and Caroline. She's old. Two minutes questions. That's all right. So, so you, you mentioned the allocation of lands, which are for grazing and for 
for uh, conservation, mm -hmm. uh, two separate areas. In uh, the Nara district, uh, there's been there's stress yeah. because when the pastoralists go into uh, the conservation area, they're fine. Yeah. The fine is often more than their their year of uh, revenues that would be coming in. So there's a lot of stress. I, I wondered here, what kind of negotiation and accommodation is there between those who want to herd and those and the maintenance of the, of the conservation area, and uh, you know whether the community feels supportive or whether they resent that land being taken. We didn't the Northern co Conservancies, we, we don't necessarily have cultivation, so we have not cultivation, we, but uh, but we have what we call areas where there's, for example, a lot, right. and then we have grazing space and all the settlement uh, uh, areas. When uh, there's enough grass and all that, everything seems to be okay. But usually uh, when there's drought, there's of course frustration because you're not allowed to graze near the lodges, what we call the core areas. And uh, of course, um, there are fines that people pay. If you graze before the grazing committee and the board have agreed that this is the period to get in there, you'll find you know, like a goat and all that. So depends with the time. Sometimes people appreciate and also appreciate the benefit they get from lodges and kids going to schools and all that. But of course, being the pastoralist and our livestock and being the core of who we are, uh, during extreme drought seasons, no one really cares about the world. We want to save the livestock. So it, that's, that's the ideal situation of what is happening on the ground. Yeah, thank you, Beatrice. We, uh, we, must, we haven't had the chance to meet, but uh, I also have um, a lot of my work um, in, in southern Kenya. I've been really interested and passionate about looking at gender and generations, looking at the role of women um, and also young, young people in the process of um, natural resource management and uh, land tenure changes. Um, I just want to make a comment about also in, in light of your presentation and your work and some of the comments that have come up in response to it. Um, while I do think, I, I agree that there's this apparent sort of um, paradox, something that has helped me uh, uh, considerably is to sort of differentiate between um, formal and informal or even semi-formal forms of power that women have. So um, a, a, a part of my research has looked at the recreation of the commons under land fragmentation and land privatization. And there I found actually much like you started your presentation that women um, are actually used uh, or they use their networks and their nodes of relationships to access pasture under private title. So they are playing a central role in recreating the commons, which is essential economic position of power, well recognized by the family, well recognized by their husbands, right? Um, and so a lot of the questions that ha that has spurred is how has that changed roles and responsibilities and authority within the family and, and within other aspects of their lives? Um, how has that generated some power in, in other domains of life and with what implications? And I think we tend to, um, conflate having power or influence or decision-making ability with being overworked, they often come hand in hand. People with a lot of power and decision-making are also really overworked, um, which is often the case uh, in, in, I think, Maasai families in the communities that I work. The women feel really overworked, but that is not a, a position of disempowerment. That's actually because they have so much to do and so much control over what they're doing, et cetera, and negotiation. I also get sort of um, a bit uncomfortable when um, the, what I would say is, is a semi-formal or almost formal claim that men own the livestock and control it. And the, yeah, you'd be hard pressed to find in many of the, 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 the families um, that I know quite well, a man who would easily sell his livestock without permission of his wife, right? He would get in a whole lot of trouble. 
and sort of recognizing, right, this would create lots of conflict. And so, yes, they have the power customarily, it's their domain, right? But this is constantly negotiated. Yeah. And, um, and, and so while there's a, you know, a call here to look at the historical and the big picture, I still think we need to look at the very small picture, the actions, the, the, the informal ways in which people are negotiating these processes, and make sure that when we establish programs and policies that try to empower women, we don't disempower them by um, shifting away from these ways in which they benefit from the flexibility and uh, of this informal power position and situation. And that we recognize what those are before we start implementing new strategies for empowering them, right? That might actually dismantle some of those. So these are some of the yeah. issues that I think uh, are quite important. Okay, maybe to mention something about the Big Works program is uh, in as much as these women work in and do international markets and all that, um, we try to explain to the market that uh, these women are pastoralists, they need to continue with their way of life and all that, such that uh, they only do the Big Works during their free time. So it's not um, a a factory setup, or they all come to one area and beat like the whole day. No, they just understand when the timelines are and uh, when they migrate during droughts and all that. We actually like find ways of reaching out to them, so they don't necessarily like come to one big building and sit and be. It's very flexible to their way of life, and um, so that they are able to continue being the pastoral women they are. Thank you, Beatrice. So, we'll uh, 